Back for another edition of In the Huddle, guys. Carl Dukes, along with my man Brian Baldinger. Baldy, the voice is weak, but I'm <laughs> going to do the best I can. I lost right. it over the weekend, uh, over Father's Day weekend, and I hope you guys have a great uh, had a great Father's Day. Yeah. Let's talk about a couple of things that are going on. As camp has broken, most teams, all teams for that matter, are now in this, this lull of we just need to get back to camp, have everybody healthy, have everybody be uh, available, right? Everybody come back in shape. It's kind of something you talked about. Over these next four to five weeks, talk to me before we get into some some other things and, and topic-wise. From a team standpoint, doesn't matter what team it is in the NFL, that's the goal, right? Get everybody available, stay healthy, come back, don't get in trouble, stay in shape. All those things, all these coaches are preaching the same things, aren't they, Baldy? Well, they're saying, um, first of all, nothing good happens after midnight, Carl. <laughs> nothing. All right. So, I mean, you want to go out, have some friends, you know, fun with your friends. I mean, I always did before the start of the season, went home, me and my brothers, my buddies, like we had our time, you know, whatever that was. But, I mean, that's just the message every coach is going to, every coach is going to tell the players. Nothing good's happening after midnight. Don't, don't make the news, like say out of the news. All right. And come back in shape. because. Like, I remember my rookie year in Dallas, Gil Brandt, who's our general manager, you know, just said, we're going to get, you know, we've got our, 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 our conditioning test when you get there. Make sure you can pass it. Uh, you know, blisters aren't an excuse when you break in a new pair of shoes. Like, do all that stuff beforehand. Um, you know, and players are pretty smart about it. But that's the last thing you want to do is get hurt between now and the start of training camp. Um, I remember a teammate of mine, we were out uh, doing the late thing, Carl, one time, and we're all in the back, you know, in the inner tube. We're having a good time out there. And this is crazy, but our starting left tackle uh, sprained his medial collateral ligament on an inner tube. I don't know, going too fast, trying to do something stupid, whatever it was. Yeah, sure. That didn't sit well with the head coach. Uh, and all that stuff, it could be innocent. It could be fun. But honestly, like, just don't jeopardize uh, the start of training camp. We 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 need you, um, and we need uh, we, we need all ninety bodies to start camp on time and in shape. That's basically the message. Baldy, let's talk about Dalvin Cook for a second because he went on the Adam Schefter podcast and basically said if DeAndre Hopkins and himself ended up on the same team, uh, that that would be something epic for the NFL. First of all, is do you think that's even possible? If if the Patriots are really interested in D Hop and whether they would sign Dalvin Cook, I mean, it's a great fantasy, you know, fantasy land conversation. But I don't think these two guys are going to end up in the same place. Do you? No, I don't. Only because, I mean, Ramondre Stevenson had a great year last year. I mean, he led the team in rushing and he led the team in receiving, averaging over four, you know, over five yards of carry. Um, he's, he's the running back. Number one, um, can Dalvin play? I mean, of course, Dalvin could help out any team, but there's a financial component to it and teams aren't going to jeopardize because you got to have some cushion for injuries during the season to sure. sign players or whatever it might be, or to, uh, lock up somebody who's having a great season. Uh, you got to have that flexibility. See, so I just can't see, I mean, one is going to cost a bunch. Two is just almost unaffordable for almost any team out there. Most of the teams that had money, Carl, like the Chicago Bears, they went out and used their money in free agency uh, already. And so the teams that had cap space used it in free agency and used it to sign their own players. Like, I just don't see that happening. Although, look, all players want to kind of be like LeBron and, you know, create their super team. Yeah. and do that kind of stuff. But it's just formidable uh, in the NFL under the salary cap restrictions out there. So we know D-Hop visited the Patriots. He also visited Tennessee last week. He's 31 years old. Uh, Dalvin Cook played six seasons for the Vikings. He turns 28 in August. Um, was set to make $14 million. And, Baldy, the real question for me is, is he going to recoup that money? Is anybody going to pay Dalvin Cook $14 million? Um you know, he was what, 14.1 million in Minnesota's cap for the 2023 season. 
Um, I, I don't think he comes any, anywhere close to that. I, I think he'd be lucky to get eight million dollars well, somewhere. I mean, this is the reality, Carl. The reality is the highest paid running back in free agency this year was Miles Sanders. Went to Carolina, somewhere around six and a half million dollars. Okay. Okay. That I mean, that's that's kind of now Miles had his best season ever. He started 17 games, stayed healthy for the first time in his four-year career. Um, he 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 was a really good player behind maybe the league's best offensive line. So Carolina, you know, snapped him up. Um, they want to run the ball. Miles is probably running back number one in Carolina right now. But the fact is, Josh Jacobs is out there in the franchise tag, hasn't signed it. Uh, Dalvin's out there. Uh, Saquon. Saquon's out there. Yep. Ezekiel Elliott is out there. Uh, Kareem Hunt is out there. Kareem mm. Hunt, as a rookie, led the league in rushing in Kansas City. Nobody cares about that anymore. Uh, it was a solid backup uh, and change of pace back with Nick Chubb. Nobody cares about that. The fact is that these running backs, I mean, Dallas is paying Tony Pollard. Um, you know, over $10 million, they're not going to pay two guys that kind of money. So the reality is, is that I could go through Aaron Jones in Green Bay, running back number one, took somewhere around a $5 million haircut to stay in Green Bay. The market just isn't $10 million plus. It just isn't. And so I don't think any of these backs, including, like, I, I'm anxious to see what happens to Saquon. He's got till July 17th to sign the franchise tender. Um, maybe they get a long-term deal done before July 17th. I kind of doubt that it, that's going to happen. They could literally franchise tag Saquon two years in a row and see if, you know, the health, the production, all that kind of stuff, Carl, is able to, you know, stay really, really good. And then they got a decision to make. Um, but that's, that's an option for the New York Giants. And I don't know what Saquon's – I mean, the option for any of these guys – is to just withhold their services. I don't think it benefits the player. It doesn't benefit the team. I don't think you ever recoup the money back. We know that Levy and Bell did that. Yeah. Uh, he was never the same back. Um, I hear all these metrics out there, you know, about Josh Jacobs. Um, you know, he comes somewhere in the middle of the pack as far as, I don't know, top speed. or you know, Look, the guy's got heart for the game. There's no metric for that. There's no analytics for that. Like, he's got a smile on his face going to work every day. Now, if he doesn't get a, a deal, does all that remain the same? Is he the same player that we saw last year leading the league in rushing? Those are things that I think running backs have to come to grips with because it's supply and demand, Carl. Like, yeah. you you just can go out and find these running backs in the third, fourth. Cam Akers, the third-round pick, he's running back number one, you know, in uh, with the Los Angeles Rams. Austin Eckler was a free agent. Um, great player. Great production. I don't know what the market is. It doesn't look like it's north of $10 million for any of these backs. And you can say, well, you know, why is that? Well, it's it's literally that. It's supply and demand. You just keep finding these guys in the lower rounds right now that are starting. Baldy, uh, let's talk about uh, Stefan Diggs. And before we do, guys, make sure you like us, tell your friends, and subscribe so that you can't miss an episode of In the Huddle. Jason Lock on four, part of this podcast as well. Carl Dukes, Brian Baldinger. Um, Diggs last week, we talked a little bit about this. The attendance, he was there, he wasn't there. Then his coach came out and said, hey, there's no problems. So here's the report this week. Diggs is frustrated with his role in the offense and says he also is frustrated with his lack of say in the play calling, which is interesting to me, Baldy. Because I don't know any receiver in the league that's saying, hey, I need to be more involved in the play calling or getting me the ball more. It's call the play. If you're open, I'll get it to you, right? I mean, that's that's kind of how this thing goes. And you want to get it to your playmakers. But on the surface, it seems like this may not be a big deal as Sean McDermott addressed it last week. But if, in fact, this report is true, this is this is going to be the problem I talked about last week where he comes back to camp He's still frustrated. Nothing changes. And then we get into the season and he's a disgruntled player who is, and I'm not going to say he's going to derail the Buffalo Bills. They're Super Bowl contenders. But this kind of stuff doesn't help, Baldy. It doesn't. Ken Dorsey's the offense coordinator. I don't know what changes. He was targeted 154 times. 
I mean, if, if Stefan was on this podcast with us right now, Carl, I'd go, is it the number of targets, Stefan? Is it the in a playoff game, are you not getting it because the quarterback doesn't see you? Mm. The defense is taking you out. There's another way to free you up. Like don't like that's a conversation. That's a legit conversation. Like if Cincinnati is doing this to you, but by the same token, your offense line is breaking down left and right, and they really can't handle Cincinnati's defensive front. So is it the quick game, the, the hitches, the getting the ball out of Josh's hands quicker and putting your hands and let you make the play? Like those are fair conversations to have with Ken Dorsey and Josh Allen. It doesn't it, it does him no good to go to a mandatory mini camp and then not practice because this is hanging over. These this is things that can be th- that you can sit down and discuss and put the game film on in Cincinnati, Kansas City, some other games that you've lost in in real t- in, in recent years. And th- but those are things that you should do in April and May when right. you're in the building. This is not something where Josh Allen or Von Miller has to come out and defend you as a teammate. Like it just does it, it's bad optics. It doesn't get anything done and then it leads to all of this. It leads to us speculating, it leads to, you know, Adam Schefter and whatever he had to say, Mike Florio, whatever he has to write. Like, it just leads to that kind of speculation. And then, ultimately, the worst part, and I don't want to do this to Stefan at all, because I like Stefan, but it puts him in that diva category. Yeah. And divas right. don't win championships. But I can tell you, receivers that won playoff games this year that were literally crying in the locker room because they didn't get the ball. Now, that don't, I mean, I'm not going to call the guy out, but that's just a, a reality in a lot of places. And I don't know, like when the Eagles won their first Super Bowl uh, in Super Bowl 52 up in Minneapolis, like they didn't have a receiver that had a thousand yards receiving. You know, I mean, it was a total team win. They, they didn't have a guy that had 10 sacks. You know, they didn't have a thousand yard rusher, but they won a Super Bowl. So, is there a give and take there? If Buffalo would go on and win a Super Bowl, but Stefan isn't the star, is that going to be okay? Mm. Like, you know, you know like, like, does the team effort overcome or over? Like, oh, you would hope that it would. That's just a, you know, just a, a scenario that I'm throwing out there right now. Here's what's interesting, Baldy. Uh, and I'm just looking at the numbers. So he caught. Four passes on 10 targets in that loss to the Bengals you're talking about. Um, And then remember, he left the locker room in a hurry, did not address the media. So all of that stuff is still lingering, apparently. Again, this is the report that's out there, guys, about uh, Bill's Mafia and what's going on with Stephon Diggs, frustrated with his role in the offense and his say in the play calling. So the numbers say this, Baldy, and this is what you were just talking about. So they're they're pass-catching options after him are limited, right? He's one of the most versatile versatile receivers in the game, but last year the Bills had a successful play 61% of the time when they targeted Diggs, when they targeted someone else. So Josh Allen throws to someone else, that dropped down to 50.7%. So point is, you know, Diggs may be knowing this. He may know these numbers, his agent, whoever, and he's saying when I get, when I get thrown to, we have success. When I'm not thrown at or thrown to or targeted, That number goes down, and obviously our offense lacks. I don't know how much of this all plays into just the the sit down, have a conversation at the table, let's get all this crap off our chest. But those are the numbers. And it says that when you throw it to Diggs, you have more successful plays than not. Okay. I mean, I, I, you know, there's there's a metric for everything, and you can make it do whatever you want it to do. Um, It's just another data point. the, and the and Baldy, that, I don't, I don't that, agree with it. I'm just saying, no, no, no. If he I, wants I, to I, complain. You know what I'm saying? He could probably use this as this is why I feel this way. Look at, look at what happens when the ball comes my way. Yeah. Well, I mean, they played from behind in the playoff loss to Cincinnati. It was ugly. It was an ugly ten points. I mean, they were never competitive in the game. No. And and that's not because I mean, the weather probably had something to do a little bit to do with it. Cincinnati was a better football team. So it's still a team game, and you just can't 
take deep shot after deep shot and say, okay, we're going to go, you know, chase the Bengals here with this type of offense. I mean, that's not a good way to play football. Um, they had a hard time sustaining offense against Cincinnati. They had blitzes that got home against Josh Allen. Josh Allen was running for his life with breakdowns up front. Every single offensive lineman broke down from Deion Dawkins to Ryan Bates, like you name it, Spencer yeah. Brown, they all broke down and it led to quick pressure. And so Stefan's out there throwing his hand up in the air. Josh Allen's on the other side of the field running for his life. Like, you know, like they, I, I think if I was Stefan Diggs, I'm like, look, they, they brought in Connor McGovern. We'll see what he does. They drafted, you know, Osiris Torrance. We'll see what he does. Maybe the guard play is better. Um, you know, better they run the ball a little bit better up front. I mean, that's it looks like that's kind of what they're trying to do to get bigger, tougher. You know, when the, so when they go against Cincinnati or Kansas City in a playoff game, or if they're going up against Miami and some of the beasts they have, or the Jets this year, like maybe they can better better handle somebody's front coming after them. Um, but maybe it's frustration with Ken Dorsey. You know, maybe he's he's a new offensive coordinator. They lost. You know, Brian Dable, who obviously was, you know, a really good play caller and a very good, successful first-time head coach, maybe there's frustration with the way the offense is called. And if that's the case, the Buffalo Bills aren't making any changes there. I mean, Ken Dorsey's the offensive coordinator. He's the play caller. He's been groomed to do that. But my point is, regardless of the level of frustration, where it stems from, this has to be done in house, Carl. Mm. It can't be done where there's a like a yeah. sit down on your way out to your mandatory mini camp, where everybody now is talking about this. Like that's just not the way to do it. It has to be done in house, and it has to be done with Sean McDermott and the play callers or the quarterback or whatever it is. Like there's plenty of time in the off season to address the frustration. Baldy. Uh- uh, the HBO series Hard Knocks, I love it. Um, over the years, uh, you know, we get access to all these teams that we don't normally have access to. And regardless if you're a fan or not, you find yourself an NFL fan watching. So they're looking for a new home, right? They're looking for a team to take on the responsibility of being on Hard Knocks this year. And Robert Sala, and I know you've done some stuff with the Jets, and I want to get your opinion on this, basically came out and said, you know, um, there are several teams that would love hard knocks to be in their building. And Robert Sala said this on June 9th in a press conference. And then he said, but we're just not one of them. So Aaron Rodgers is the biggest story this off season, hands down. But yet Robert Sala, the head coach doesn't want his team to partake in HBO hard knocks. The bears, the commanders and the saints technically could be forced to partake in HBO hard knocks because it's an NFL thing. Talk to me about the Jets, good or bad, that they don't want it or that they should do it. I would love to see it because of Aaron Rodgers and this storyline that we've been talking about all offseason. I understand why Robert Sala doesn't want it. There's already enough hype and media attention to the Jets. This would just make it explode. But it would be really good, and it would be really entertaining. I mean, Rex Ryan did it one year. It was highly entertaining. Sure. All right. And they were successful. Detroit did it last year. And I think a big part of Detroit's success was just this is who the Detroit Lions are. This is Dan Campbell. This is Deuce Staley. This is how they operate. And I thought it was a good thing. The Cleveland Browns did it one year. You'll remember, Carl. I think it was the best year the Browns had. I mean, you saw Baker Mayfield get on the same page as yep. OBJ and Jarvis Landry, and you saw like a work ethic that I think people really admire, and it really paid off. They, I think Baker probably, I I have to go back and check, but I think Baker had his best year. I think the Browns went to the playoffs. I mean, I think there was a lot of things at play there. Um, Personally, I think the Miami Dolphins would be a great team to showcase. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got Tyreek and Jalen Waddle. You've got these guys. You've got the quarterback who is as polished as it comes when it comes to just talking. You got a head coach who just people can't get enough of just his, whether it's just him um, just riffing or whether it's explanations or whatever. 
Like there's a lot there. You 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 got Jalen Ramsey and Xavier Howard and Javon Holland and Jalen Phillips. You've got these and Christian Wilkins. You got these defensive stars that are looking to put it all together with a coach and Vic Fangio who could be crusty as they come, but it probably would be good TV to watch Vic, you know, in a in a meeting, call out a player or explain whatever it is. Like there's a lot there. But I do think if you said the Jets, I think there's a benefit to it. Okay. Because you've got a young Sauce Gardner. He might be the best corner in football. If you got Sauce going up against Garrett Wilson in practice, I mean, you're just going to see iron sharpening iron. If you got Robert Sala just exploding uh, in a team meeting because they just didn't meet his expectations in practice that day, we get a chance to see it. I, I do think there's a benefit to being under the microscope and just saying, okay, there's mm. is, there, is it pressure or is it this is – what we have to do to compete in the AFC East and become a playoff team. And oh, by the way, it's, it's been since the last time Rex Ryan was here that we saw a playoff action. So I, I think there's a benefit to it. Joe Douglas might not want it, but Joe Douglas has been in Baltimore when it was the best hard knocks ever, you know, and there was Shannon Sharp and Sarah Goosa and, <laughs> and all this stuff that was going on. They went to a Super Bowl. Um, like there's enough, you know, if you're, if you're NFL films and you're laying this out there, you could point to successful teams that had a successful season, a Super Bowl winning season, and it started in hard knocks. And you go back to the Baltimore Ravens 2000, year 2000, and watch what that team did with Ray Lewis and, and Shannon, the whole group. And um, like maybe that's where it all started. Baldy, did you see, and I know you did. Um, <laughs> the championship rings for the Kansas city chiefs and how ridiculous they are. Yeah. I mean, listen, I'm all about, you know, flaunting and flossing and showing off my, you know, my accomplishments, but these rings are just getting ridiculous. And yeah. listen, I, I'm not, I'm not going to criticize because we know the work that it takes to get there. But, you know, I, I was telling this story every year you go to the Super Bowl. I don't know if Justin still does it, but for years they used to have the rings posted, right? Yeah. And you could go back and see, you know, Green Bay and Super Bowl one and and the ring literally, guys. I mean, seriously, the ring was like this big as a normal ring. And then it goes all the way up and these rings started to change right in the 90s and now in the early 2000s. And I mean, Kansas City's ring is like the size of my hand. All right. It's unbelievable. And I'm just wondering, you know, I heard Patrick Mahomes say, hey, it's locked up in the house. He's focused on the next one. You know, he, he he's not even he's not going to wear it. I know Brady didn't wear his. You know, he did the party thing and that that famous picture's out there where he's got all his rings on. But most of these guys don't wear them. They they don't they don't wear them. No, they can't. And my my favorite ring story is you're right there in Atlanta. You know, the Patriots. You know, beating uh, the Falcons and there's 283 diamonds in the <laughs> ring for being down 28 three in the game. Yeah, and never say never, never say die. And they, you know, they use that as that was their motivating call. Two hundred, you know, twenty-eight to three. They put two hundred eighty-three diamonds. I don't even know how you you set, you know, you set two hundred eighty-three diamonds in a ring, any ring. But it is gaudy. Nobody can wear them. They're way too big. Um, they're just, and that's what they do. They they put them in a lockbox, and you take it out maybe for a special occasion. I do like the fact that you know Kansas City celebrated really celebrated the ring ceremony recalling that the prior one was canceled because of the pandemic right so they, it's almost for some of the guys they were able to celebrate almost twice on that night but i do like what mahomes said is like when this is over it's all about going forward and it's almost like okay we're going to have this ridiculous ceremony um we're all going to celebrate and they did and it, it is way too big you can't even like it, it just, it, you can't even put it like a, on a, like a, a necklace and wear it around you. It's too big, but it is about the ring. Um, once you put that thing in the bank, you can never take it out. Nobody can right. ever take it away from you. Yeah. So it's earned. Um, and now it's all about going forward for Kansas city. That's behind him. But that was some, it was some kind of celebration. I'll tell you that. No, they, they, they got it in as we like to say, they, they definitely got it in. All right, but as we finish things up, I, I want you to turn around. And I want you to tell me about this picture that I'm looking at with you in a cowboy uniform 
with the star on your helmet. I want you to tell me about about your time there, because I got to tell you this, and and you know this, I'm originally from Texas. Uh, Watching the Cowboys was like religion. Um, You know, my mom on Sundays, she was the one really that that got us into Cowboys and on and everybody shut up. So it was one of those things as a kid. You just you just grew up with it. And I'm curious to know, as I look at that picture behind you, your experience putting that star on because it's a big deal. And I tell people this, like it's life changing. Everybody that I've talked to since I've gotten in this business, whether it be Emmett Smith, Troy Aikman, it doesn't matter. Right. Those guys were superstars, but even the guys, Baldy, who weren't, who played for the Cowboys, it stays with them and people remember you. Like, that's the amazing thing about being a Cowboy. And and this is no disrespect to any other franchise, but guys, it's different. It just is. And I I want you to talk about that for a second. Well, I mean, you live, you grew up in Texas. Um, You know, there's football and there's spring football. I mean, it's just, it's football. It's football country. Always has been. Um, it, 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 like I played, I played for the Colts. I played for the Eagles. People want to know about the Cowboys, Carl. It's just, <laughs> I got pictures in all these different uniforms. Yeah. But it was, it still is. So we had a reunion in Dallas this year. Drew Pearson put, put it on. And really the theme of the reunion, it was unofficial. It wasn't sponsored by the Cowboys. It was just Drew calling up his buddies. From that era, you know, Roger Staubach, Bob Lilly, we were all there. Wow. Randy White, Two Tall Jones, uh, Tony Dorsett, um, Doug Randy, Cosby. Randy White was a dude, wasn't he? Woo! So, so I, I'll just say this. Like, when I went there, Carl, in 1982, uh, I signed a free agent contract. Uh, they, they, they signed so many free agents. They had enough scouts to sign them. They sent the equipment manager to sign me, Buck Buchanan. Like they sent secretaries out, trainers out, anybody that worked in a building, they'd send them out to try and sign these contracts. And so I negotiated with the equipment manager. I got them up from $500 signing bonus to $1,200 signing bonus because I had a car that had no brakes and I had to get the brakes fixed to drive it home. So the brakes had gone on it. So the car was just sitting there. And I told Buck, I looked, look, Buck, $500 won't fix these brake lines. I need new brakes. (laughs) I got a Plymouth Fury. I want to drive it home when school ends. So he called back to, you know, Gil Brand or whoever, and they got me a $1,200 signing bonus. But the, the good thing was when I went to training camp, and I didn't know this, they signed 110 free agents just like me, along with 15 drafted rookies. So it was 125 of us. All Everybody came to camp. Everybody came to camp. And wow. the, all the rookies, we scrimmaged every day. And practice every day for 10 days before the veterans got there. So we we had 20 practices before the vets even showed up. <clears throat> and then we were basically, um, when when the veterans showed up, I asked if I could play left guard. You know, they were looking at me at right guard, center, left guard. I said, I want to play left guard because I want to go up against Randy White every day in practice. Mm. I want to see what, what it's like to, to try to block the manster. And he was all of that. And so I, I did all the car drills, you know, I'd go up against Randy White for 16 plays, then go up against Don Smirk for 16 plays, his backup. And that was kind of my day. And then when practice ended, the rookies scrimmaged. So we literally had a three hour practice and then we scrimmaged for 45 minutes at the end of every day. But the good thing was going up against Randy White, like I got, I got better in a hurry. It was either you got your butt whipped or you learned and you got better. And so I tell, I mean, I've told Randy this for years, but, I never would have made the Cowboys as a rookie free agent. There were six mm. of us, six rookies that made the, the team that year out of 125. But I never would have made it if I didn't get a chance to go up against Randy every day. And so, you know, when, when you come there, you know, the rookies, we changed in a separate locker room. We didn't change in the locker room with the veterans. We wore white pants. They blue wore blue pants. We had a helmet. We didn't have a star on the helmet. Star on it. That's right. You had to go earn that star. <laughs> yeah. And I love that. I love that. You know, like we, we hadn't done nothing. We hadn't earned anything. We we're just rookies. We we're a piece of meat, whatever you want to call it. But I love that concept that um, the rookies had to earn the star. That didn't matter if you were the first round pick or if you're a free agent like myself, um, you earned that star. And so it meant something. It meant a lot. You know, when you, you come out there, Texas stadium at first preseason game and they're playing 
uh, Mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. And you hear that song, Carl, like you never forget that. And then when you go into RFK and they're playing Hail to the Redskins, I know things have changed, but Hail to the Redskins were being sure. played. Sure, it was a you big come deal. out of that tunnel, Carl. Yeah. And you got that star on the side of your helmet. And this is as big a rivalry as there is in sports, period. Um, nobody liked each other. Um, it was it was a battle. Like that stuff, you never forget. You never forget that. You never forget the stories. You never forget telling the stories. In fact, when we got together at this reunion with Drew, I mean, Drew's thing, Carl, was I'm tired of going. I'm tired of getting together at funerals. Mm. Let's get together and we can tell our stories when yeah. we're still here. Yeah. And so I love that concept. I'll never stop going back. As long as Drew is doing that, I'm going back every year. I'll make the time. But the stories, they never leave you. They just never do. It's the best thing about the locker room, guys. It's the yeah. best thing about sports. And if you played any level, you remember certain things from middle school to high school. If you play college, you get to the pros. When, when you talk to people, that's the one thing that they all miss are the stories surrounding their, their battles and their friends and talking about, you know, you remember we double teamed this guy and what he did and, and you're just talking about all these stories. One these thing triggers another thing. Oh, it's well, just, and that's it's the triggered. best. It's the, that, I totally agree with you. That's the best. Baldy, thanks for sharing that, man. I just, yeah. you know, we're, we're always traveling around and you're doing stuff. And uh, I saw the picture in the background, Yeah, but, but you know, I, I'm in my office. You can't see all of it, but I've got all these talking pieces. That's a talking piece right there. That's a talking, yeah, that's a, a conversation starter, my friend. You got Great it. stuff. You got a call. Thanks. All right, guys, we're going to come back. We'll be back at you on uh, Thursday. We release new episodes Tuesday and Thursday. And uh, as we do on In the Huddle, subscribe, like us. We're on YouTube as well. Don't miss an episode. We'll come back. We've got a lot more stuff to dive into on Thursday, so make sure you're here. Hey, thanks for being here, Baldy. Great job. We'll talk to you next yep. uh, on Thursday, guys. Uh